Welcome back. In this video, we will cover chapter number 10 in our anatomy course, uh, the endocrine system, the body's other control center. A quick introduction to the, the system itself. Uh, the nervous system, along with the endocrine system, are totally interconnected and are always monitoring each other's activities. You know, in addition to the nervous system, the endocrine system controls a good bit of what your body does on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it will collect information just like the nervous system does, but it sends information along at a much slower, more at a slower rate, and often has a more subtle control system. Even though it acts more slowly, the effects will last longer than it would of a nervous system. Sometimes the effects of the endocrine system can be hours or even days long. Learning objectives for this chapter: discuss the functions of the end of the various endocrine glands, uh, describe the purpose and effects of hormones within the body. Uh, discuss the process of homeostatic control and feedback mechanisms of hormone levels. Uh, be able to differentiate between hormonal control, humoral control, and neural control of hormones. And explain uh, common diseases of the endocrine system. Uh, first, we'll start off with the organization of the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a series of organs and glands uh, throughout the body that secrete chemical messengers. And these chemical messengers are called hormones. And they're secreted into the bloodstream. So endo means inside. And the ending crin, or crine, up here, means uh, secretions. So these are secretions going into the blood. Now the opposite of these exocrine glands, or exocrine organs, like uh, sweat glands, salivary glands, lacrimal glands, and so on, produce an exocrine secretion. These will exit a gland you know, through a duct, go to the external environment. So that's a little bit different than what we're talking about for this chapter. These are secretions that go into the blood. And there are many organs and many glands that have multiple functions. The pancreas, for example, has both an endocrine and exocrine function. Uh, the hypothalamus has an endocrine and exocrine function. I hear some common examples of some endocrine glands uh, and their hormones. Uh, pineal gland up here in the brain. Uh, hypothalamus. Uh, pituitary gland, the master gland. One we'll spend a lot of time on in this video. Uh, the adrenals here, right on top of the kidneys. Parathyroid thyroids here. Uh, thymus. Of course, for males, uh, the testes, and for females, ovaries, and the pancreas here. And here's a table of very basic endocrine organs and the hormone that they released and their effects that they have. And we'll spend a good bit of time in this video going over many of these. All right, like we mentioned before, hormones, uh, chemical messengers that are released by endocrine glands, and they're released into the bloodstream and travel all over the body. Remember, when something is inside your blood, it will travel the entire network that you're that your blood travels. This can affect sometimes millions of cells all at the same time, assuming they have the right receptor for that hormone. And the effects of these hormones could be something as short as a few minutes, or it could be uh, several hours or even several days long. Now many hormones are secreted constantly, and the amount that's secreted is changed as needed. Sometimes you need it turned up, sometimes you need it turned down. Here's a, a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison between neurotransmitters and hormones how they're similar, but also how they're different. Uh, for example, they're both chemical messengers. They both will bind to a receiving uh, target cell. Uh, neurotransmitters will control how excited a cell is, but a hormone will control a cell's activities. Of course, neurotransmitters are released by neurons. Uh, hormones can be, be released by neurons or glands or organs. Uh, neurotransmitters are released at the synapse. Hormones are released into the blood. Neurotransmitters are usually their target will be very close to where they're synapsing, but for hormones, they usually usually will travel to a, a distant target. Uh, the effects of neurotransmitters happen relatively quickly, you know, much less than one second. But for hormones, the effects take time to kick in and will last much longer. The neurotransmitters affect only a single cell, as for hormones, can affect hundreds of thousands or even millions of cells all at the same time. So there are some similarities between the two, but there are some big differences between the two also. Right, now, hormones will work by binding to receptors on target cells. So they can only, or they can bind to sites outside of the cell, but also inside the cell also. If a hormone binds to the outside of a cell, it can have a variety of different effects, either by changing the permeability of the cell membrane, or sending a target cell a message to change the activity inside of the cell. Now, most special class of these hormones are called steroids. These are particularly powerful because they bind to sites inside the cells. Now, steroids are a lipid-based molecule 
that can pass easily through a target cell membrane, which allows them to interact directly with the cell's DNA to change that cell's activity. Now these types of compounds must be controlled you know, very tightly because even small amounts can greatly impact their, their performance and impact the cell. Now move on to the control of endocrine activity. Uh, the amount of hormone that gets secreted will change based on depending on your situational demands. Now many endocrine organs will secrete hormones constantly. It depends on in what volume they are made. Now many chemical and physical characteristics of the body have a standard uh, set point that is ideal for a particular value. Blood pressure, blood sugar, heart rate, oxygen. There's a standard on where your body should be you know, at all times. So your control systems, everybody, you know, the endocrine and nervous systems, work to keep these levels near or at their ideal level. Now there is a way for the body to measure these variable levels, the place where the ideal level is stored, and also a way to uh, fix those levels when they get out of this normal range. So for example, the hypothalamus in the brain stores the ideal setting for your uh, temperature for your body. Yet an example of a, of a thermostat controlling uh, your body's temperature. But in this example, we're using a air conditioner and a furnace of a house. If it gets too hot, then the air conditioner will kick in, reacting to a negative feedback, so the temperature gets cooled down. If the temperature gets too cold, then the furnace will kick in due to negative feedback, releasing heat to increase the heat. So there's a, a balance here. If it's too hot, then the AC kicks in. If it's too cold, then the heater turns on. If any of the body's uh, homeostatic values are seriously disrupted, the control systems will kick in to bring back to the more ideal levels. This is done by negative feedback. Now, negative feedback will counteract a change, and hormones will work the same way. If hormone levels rise, then negative feedback will turn off endocrine organs that are secreting that hormone. Okay, the same analogy that we made with the, uh, the air conditioner and the heater in the home, it works the same way for using negative feedback to control your body's temperature. So when you get too hot, this will send commands to uh, the blood vessels and your sweat glands you know, through negative feedback to increase blood flow, which will increase uh, the amount of sweating. So it'll help cool your body down. Okay, the opposite of that would be if, you're, if your body's getting too cold, this will send a negative feedback signal to uh, blood vessels and sweat glands, for example. So blood vessels will constrict to direct the flow of blood more toward the vital organs so you don't lose any more heat than you already are. The sweat glands will basically be turned off because when you sweat, you cool down, so you don't want to be any cooler than you already are. So this will stimulate uh, shivering of muscles also to help generate more heat in order to raise your body temperature. So it's the same process of negative feedback for both when your body gets too high a temperature or gets too low a temperature. Now positive feedback increases the magnitude of change. So for example, uh, the flow of sodium into a neuron uh, during depolarization. The more depolarized that neuron becomes, more sodium flows in. So it becomes more depolarized. It causes more sodium to flow in and so on. It's getting more and more influenced by the flow of sodium. So, and positive feedback is not a way to regulate your body because it increases the change away from a set point. If you're trying to control something from turning on, turning off, you're going to be using negative feedback. Just like in your home, when you have the uh, the heater set on a certain point. Once the house is heated to that point, the, the heater will turn off because there's no point to, there's no reason to go beyond that set point. And the same thing with the air conditioner. Once it's cooled to that certain point, it turns itself off due to negative feedback. Now, some hormones are directly controlled by the nervous system. Uh, for example, the adrenal glands will receive signals uh, directly from the sympathetic nervous system. So when the sympathetic nervous system is active, it will send signals directly to the adrenal glands to release epinephrine and norepinephrine, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. This will prolong the effect of the sympathetic activity. So when you are in a stressful situation, the sympathetic nervous system is what takes over and so will control the levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Here's an illustration of the sympathetic control of the adrenals. Of course, you start up here. The adrenals are the glands that sit on top of the kidneys. There are two regions, the cortex and the medulla. Each region makes different uh, types of hormones or controls different hormones. And epinephrine and norepinephrine come from the medulla region of the adrenals. And it's controlled by this region of the sympathetic nervous system here. Now, other hormones are part of a hierarchy of hormonal control. So in this situation, you have glands that are controlled by other glands 
and they are controlled by other glands. And what controls uh, this feedback system is a negative feedback system. This will control the flow of the orders given from one organ to the next, and from them to the next, and so on. And here's a good, good example of that. You have hypothalamus up here. You have the pituitary gland here, leading to the adrenals. Uh, the blue arrows indicate uh, stimulatory effects. The red indicate inhibitory or negative feedback. So whenever you have, let's say, stress or hypoglycemia, for example, that will cause a CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, to impact or to increase the stimulation of ACTH for the pituitary. ACTH will control the hormones of the cortex of the adrenal gland, and release of ACTH will turn off the effects of CRH. And the effects of all this is to release the effect or release the hormone uh, cortisol, which will increase fat metabolism, increase protein metabolism, and also will raise blood glucose levels. This hormone is impacting this organ, which impacts this organ, which in turn will double back and turn this off. Because you don't want this to be on all the time. You don't want cortisol being made all the time. Now some endocrine organs will directly monitor uh, your body's internal environment, such as uh, body fluids, uh, blood, and then will respond accordingly. Uh, the, tomb, the term humoral will pertain to a body fluid or substance. So this is called humoral control. So it's not humor, like haha ha, funny, but humoral is always a reference to body fluids in anatomy. A good example of that is uh, the pancreas. The pancreas will secrete insulin in response to rising blood sugar levels. Here's how that would work. You have increased uh, blood sugar. That presence will stimulate the pancreas to release uh, insulin. As the insulin gets secreted, it will stimulate uptake of gl glucose within the blood by uh, skeletal muscle or storing it into fat. All right, now I'll move on to some major endocrine glands. Uh, the first one, hypothalamus, is located in the uh, diencephalon in the brain. It's a very important link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. This will control much of your physiology, including uh, hunger and thirst, uh, fluid balance, and also body temperature. It's also known as the commander-in-chief of the endocrine system, even though the most commonly known phrase associated with the system is the pituitary being known as the master gland, which is true, but the hypothalamus controls the pituitary. So this is the, the main one in charge, the hypothalamus, because the pituitary has so much of a major control, so much control over the endocrine system, but the pituitary itself is controlled by the hypothalamus. It's a quick overview of what all the hypothalamus and pituitary uh, control, no, various hormones. The acronyms are listed here, and their full names are listed up here. And also their, their targets and what they do. So ACTH, it goes to the adrenal cortex. Uh, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, growth hormone, prolactin, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, oxytocin, uh, ADH. And most of these that you see on this image for the pituitary come from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. The only two that are from the posterior lobe are the uh, oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. The pituitary, as you can see, is pretty important, but it's also controlled by the hypothalamus. That's due to inhibiting hormones or releasing hormones. A pituitary, also found in the diencephalon, often called the master gland because it has such a vital role and all the endocrine secretions, and it only acts under orders directly from the hypothalamus. So using a military reference, if the hypothalamus is the commander-in-chief, the pituitary is a very high-ranking soldier. Now, the pituitary has two uh, very distinctly different lobes, or two different sections, the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. They really are just two different structures almost fused together as one larger structure. because The two lobes are very, very different from each other. The posterior lobe is really an extension of the hypothalamus. So in here you'll find hypothalamic neurons that are specialized to secrete hormones instead of uh, neurotransmitters. And so they extend their axons through the stalk actually into the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So the posterior lobe doesn't secrete any hormones. It, the hormones that are released by this lobe are made in the hypothalamus, but they're just stored in the posterior lobe. So oxytocin and ADH, they're made in the hypothalamus, but this kept in the posterior lobe until they're needed. And now these neurons will secrete uh, two hormones, uh, antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, and oxytocin. And like I mentioned, even though they're secreted by the posterior lobe, they are synthesized in the hypothalamus. I like the name uh, indicates ADH, antidiuretic hormone. This will decrease urination, which will 
decrease fluid loss, which will increase uh, body fluid volume. So a diuretic is something that makes you urinate more. So antidiuretic will make you urinate less in order to save fluid from being lost. This is accreted when the hypothalamus senses your blood volume has become uh, decreased or there's an increase in blood osmolarity. So there's more solids suspended within the blood itself. Now this will circulate throughout the bloodstream and will target the kidneys specifically because the kidneys are responsible for absorbing water and producing urine. So this is a, an important, or this is important in the long-term control of blood pressure, especially so you do not become dehydrated. Oxytocin is important in maintaining the uh, uterine contractions during labor, also involved with uh, the production of milk in uh, nursing mothers. And the function in males is not currently known. When a woman is about to give birth and her pregnancy is uh, induced at a hospital, she's most likely given a drug called tocin, which is a synthetic form of oxytocin. So by causing the uterine muscles to contract, you're moving uh, the fetus down to the birth canal and starting the birthing process. At the anterior lobe, this will make and secrete a large number of hormones that are under hormonal control of the hypothalamus, such as growth hormone, prolactin, FSH, LH, and so on. The hypothalamus will secrete hormones that will uh, control hormone secretions by the anterior pituitary. Now, these hormone levels are controlled by negative feedback to both the pituitary and also the hypothalamus. And because the pituitary or the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland synthesizes and secretes so many different types of hormones, the best way to regulate this control is through negative feedback. All right, now move on to a pathology connection uh, with the posterior pituitary. Now, alcohol will turn off ADH production. So the more alcohol you drink, the less ADH is secreted and the more dehydrated you become. So even though you are drinking something you know, like beer or wine or, or any kind of liquor, you're becoming more and more dehydrated the more you drink, which means the more you urinate, which means even more dehydrated you'll become. So the symptoms of a hangover are due to the side effects of consuming too much alcohol because you are dehydrated. Uh, diabetes insipidus, or DI, this is caused by the underproduction of ADH due to non-cancerous tumors of the posterior pituitary. And the primary symptom of this condition is excessive urination. And by producing so much urine, you're producing very, very dilute urine. So the way your body compensates for this is you become very, very thirsty all the time. So you will drink more fluids, and then you'll urinate even more. And this condition is treated by taking medications that will function in a similar way to ADH. And even though the name diabetes insipidus has the name diabetes in it, it is not connected to diabetes mellitus. So when you hear you know, diabetes type 1 or diabetes type 2, that is diabetes mellitus. That's not the same thing as diabetes insipidus. There are some common symptoms between the two, but DI mainly focuses on the underproduction of antidiuretic hormone. It's not related to blood sugar usually. Right. Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH, is where you have very, very low blood sodium, and it's due to the overproduction of ADH, regardless of uh, your blood osmolarity. This will lead to uh, fluid retention and very, very dilute uh, blood plasma. Some causes of this condition, uh, cancers, uh, some disorders of the central nervous system, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, certain medications can lead to this. Uh, common symptoms of SIADH, uh, confusion, uh, altered consciousness, uh, fatigue, uh, muscle cramps, uh, loss of appetite. Now this is left untreated, this can lead to a brain herniation, which can be lead to a coma and also can be fatal. Often difficult to diagnose. Here we have a table of, a selected table of hypothalamic and pituitary hormones, you know what structure they come from and then their function. So the hypothalamus, uh, the posterior lobe of the pituitary, and then anterior lobe of the pituitary. This is a, a short list of all the organs, of all the hormones that are produced. All right, now move on to a pathology connection with the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Uh, the first one, hypopituitarism, is where you have a decrease in pituitary function caused by tumors or radiation or uh, head injuries or even surgeries. And whenever you have a loss of pituitary function of the anterior lobe, you'll have a a loss of some or maybe even all of uh, the hormones that the anterior lobe produces.
growth hormone, ACTH, LH, TSH. So the anterior lobe is a is a big, big player in this endocrine system. So if there's a injury or damage to this lobe, you're going to have some very serious problems. This can be difficult to diagnose because the symptoms tend to be subtle or very vague. It could be it could present as any number of other conditions. And the best way to treat this condition is to replace the hormones that are not being made by the anterior lobe. Right, the opposite of this condition will be hyperpituitarism. This is when you have the overproduction of pituitary hormones. This is usually caused by benign tumors. So because of this, you could have you know, acromegaly, you could have cardiac dysfunction, uh, reproductive abnormalities. So you don't want hormones to be made uh, in too little volume or in too high volume. This can also lead to hyperthyroidism, uh, Cushing syndrome, uh, sleep apnea. The way to diagnose this condition is to use uh, imaging studies and also by checking hormone levels. And treatment is to decrease the size of the tumor that's causing these uh, overproductions or the actual surgical removal of the tumor. Uh, some other disorders of the anterior lobe, uh, some stature disorders. This can result in being well below average height, uh, say dwarfism, or being well above normal height, gigantism. And this is caused by abnormalities in the skeletal development or uh, nutritional deficiencies or over or under production of the growth hormone. If growth hormone or GH is insufficient during childhood, the child will not grow to a standard height. So this can be treated with growth hormone injections and the child may still develop into full height. If there's an over secretion happens during childhood, uh, the person will become extremely tall. But the problem is the body can only get so big before it can't support itself anymore. This is usually caused by uh, non-cancerous tumors on the anterior uh, pituitary. You can't just keep growing and growing and growing because you're going to put an overburden on uh, the bones or on the uh, skeletal system, which will impact everything else. It will over, uh, overstress the heart, overstress the lungs, so everything will be impacted. See, for example, uh, acromegaly is, is where you have an over-secretion of growth hormone in adults. This is after the bones have stopped growing, so instead of growing... Uh, longer in length, making you taller, they get thicker. And it's also caused by some non-cancerous uh, tumors. I'll right, talk about some other major endocrine glands. Uh, the first one, the thyroid gland, is a a butterfly-shaped gland right in the anterior or the front portion of the neck. It secretes uh, thyroid hormone, which is what's how it's most commonly referenced. But there are two different kinds. You have T3 and T4. Uh, T3, triiodothyronine, and thyroxin, or T4. And both of these have the same effects. Uh, they control uh, cell metabolism and growth. So collectively, they're known as the thyroid hormones, but structurally, they are different. You know, T3 is a little bit different than T4. Yeah, table salts will contain uh, iodine, which will ensure people get enough iodine in their diet to make the thyroid hormones uh, function. If you make too much of this, or hyperthyroidism, or if you make too little hypothyroidism, there's a huge variety of, of clinical symptoms because you're talking about controlling overall metabolism in your body. If someone has a underproducing thyroid, you know, hypothyroidism, it will be very difficult for them to lose weight. They may have a perfect diet, they may work out all the time, they may be doing everything right, but if the thyroid isn't producing T3, T4 enough, or if they're not functioning properly, it'll be very difficult to lose weight without the additional help of uh, receiving injections of thyroid hormone because the the hormones that will control metabolism just aren't there so it doesn't matter what you eat or how well you eat or how well you work out if the body doesn't know how to break down its food you will just continue to gain weight it makes it very very difficult to lose weight and the thyroid gland also secretes uh, another hormone calcitonin and this will decrease uh, the blood calcium levels by stimulating bone cells and we talked about in a previous video how the skeletal system is not something that's very static. It's something that is dynamic. It's constantly being built up and constantly being stripped down uh, for minerals. So you don't want the levels of blood calcium to get too high. So calcitonin will lower blood calcium. And by doing so, you prevent the hypercalcemia. All right, here's a view of the thyroid and also the parathyroid, which we'll talk about next. They're just below the, the voice box, or the Adam's apple for males. You have the, the bilobe gland, the thyroid. And on the back side of the thyroid, you have these four small nodules here. Those are the parathyroids. 
right, the thymus gland. This has a, both an endocrine gland and a lymphatic organ located in the upper thorax. It plays a very vital role in the immune system. This is where uh, certain blood cells go to mature and become T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Uh, the thymus will produce a hormone called thymosin, which will help the, the special white blood cells mature. The T cells and B cells, they mature in response to the presence of thymosins. And one other thing about the thymus gland, uh, when we're first born, it starts off fairly large, but as, after we hit uh, puberty, it starts to become smaller and smaller and smaller. It's so about time we are middle aged, it's basically almost all gone and it's replaced by fat tissue. Uh, the pineal gland, this is a very tiny gland found within the brain. Uh, the full function isn't fully understood, but it does make the hormone called melatonin, which causes your, your rising and or waking and sleep signals. Now, this is why when it's uh, cloudy or overcast outside, this is why you feel sleepy. Your body thinks that it's, it is nighttime because the sun isn't out. So your body is getting you ready to go to bed for the night. So more melatonin is released. That's why melatonin is a sleep aid. Of course, the pancreas not only has an endocrine function, but we'll also talk about this again with the uh, digestive system because it is an, an accessory organ to that system. It's located uh, near the stomach in the upper abdomen. It will produce and secrete various digestive enzymes to help break down starches and fats and proteins. But for this chapter, what we'll focus on is the endocrine secretions. Of course, it will produce hormones that will regulate blood sugars. So it will produce uh, insulin, which will help to lower blood sugars. And then the normal range that your blood sugars should be at is between 70 to 105 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Now, having too much glucose in the cells will throw off your fluid balance. So blood glucose must be maintained at a very, fairly level range so you don't gain water or lose water within the cells. And of course, glucose is vital for cellular respiration. Glucose is the energy that your cells need to function. And the pancreas will make two different kinds of hormones that will help regulate the control of glucose, uh, insulin and glucagon. And these are produced by two different types of cells located in the endocrine clusters of cells. These are called the islets of Langerhans, or pancreatic islets. Insulin will, will remove sugar from the blood, lowering blood sugar levels. As you can imagine, this gets released when you have when you have hyperglycemia or too high of blood sugar. And the opposite of that would be glucagon. Glucagon raises blood sugar level. And it does so by telling the liver to release glucose in a stored form of glycogen. This is usually released a few hours after a meal to prevent blood glucose, blood glucose from dropping too low or becoming hypoglycemic. So insulin lowers blood sugar. Uh, glucagon will raise blood sugar. And there's a, a balance that you would want to have here, normal blood glucose. After you eat, the blood glucose levels will rise. The pancreas will secrete insulin into the blood. So insulin will be picked up by cells or stored as glycogen in the liver or stored as fat. So that will bring it back to normal. If blood glucose levels get too low, the pancreas will secrete glucagon, which will tell the liver to convert that glycogen back into glucose to put that back in the blood so it doesn't get too, too low. It also will tell the adipose or the fat cells or the fat tissue to break itself down and release more glucose into the blood. Next we'll talk about a pathology connection with the thyroid. We'll talk about hypothyroidism. Where we have too little thyroid hormone that's produced. Whenever you have too little of this hormone produced, you'll be impacting the functions of T3, T4, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, thyroid releasing hormone. Uh, some common symptoms of uh, people with hypothyroidism uh, fatigue, uh, feeling cold, uh, dry, itchy skin, brittle nails, bradycardia, which is a slow uh, resting heartbeat, depression, uh, weight gain is a very common one. All because the thyroid hormones, which help regulate metabolism, aren't working properly or it's not being made enough to work properly. Hashimoto's th uh, thyroiditis is the most common form of hypothyroidism. This is an autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland itself. This will result in an inflammation and uh, damage to the gland. It is most common in women between the ages of 30 and 50. Some common symptoms of Hashimoto's, inflammation, uh, damage to the gland, uh, swelling of the gland, where it's often difficult or painful uh, to swallow. And the best way to diagnose this condition is uh, through blood tests. Now, Hashimoto's has 
very low levels of T4, but very high levels of TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. So the thyroid is being stimulated, but it's not producing T4. And the best way to treat this is taking daily doses of a synthetic form of T4. See, congenital hypothyroidism, because it's congenital, it's present at birth. This happens in roughly 1 of 4,000 uh, live births. This is caused by an anatomical thyroid abnormality, or having no thyroid, or having thyroid uh, metabolism errors, or having uh, an iodine deficiency. Now, if left untreated, it's going to lead to very severe intellectual disabilities and very short stature in that person. That's the most common preventable cause of uh, mental retardation. Another one with the thyroid, hyperthyroidism, where you have an overproduction of thyroid hormones. Some common symptoms of feeling hot, uh, as opposed to feeling cold and hypothyroidism. Uh, muscle tremors, uh, sweating, uh, tachycardia, where you have a very fast heart rate, an exact opposite of uh, bradycardia and hypo, uh, hypothyroidism. Other common symptoms of hyperthyroidism, uh, infertility, uh, irritability, uh, loose bowels, uh, very large bulging eyes and being hypersensitive to the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, Graves' disease is the most common form of hyperthyroidism. This is also an autoimmune disorder, uh, much more common in women of childbearing age than not. What happens here is the immune system will bind to TSH receptors, stimulating the thyroid to produce excess thyroid hormone. So your immune system basically attacks and takes over the thyroid, telling it to keep churning out TSH even though when it's not necessarily needed. The acute Graves' disease uh, can result in uh, a very potentially fatal form of hyperthyroidism called a thyroid storm. And the best way to diagnose this is uh, through blood tests and increased levels of uh, radioactive iodine is uh, taken up by the thyroid. Uh, some treatments for Graves' disease you have antithyroid medications to rein in the thyroid activity to kind of turn that down, uh, beta blockers to decrease uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, taking radioactive iodine to kill thyroid cells. You know, they can't overproduce the hormone if they aren't functional. And if need to, uh, the removal of the thyroid gland. Uh, goiter uh, the, is an enlargement of the thyroid. This is a result from either hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And this can't interfere with swallowing or even breathing because you're producing a tightness in the throat. Uh, some treatments for goiter, uh, medications or radioactive iodine treatments. Those usually can shrink a goiter or if need be, you know, surgical removal of the goiter. Here's some examples. Very prominent here and here. And a little more subtle here, but still fairly obvious. The enlargements of the thyroid. Uh, some changes in the, the eyes, the enlarged bulging out eyes for Graves' disease. There shouldn't be that much of a protrusion here. It's a summary of uh, symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism side by side. And some of these will be common between the two, but some are going to be exact opposite. So for hypothyroidism is A, and B would be hyperthyroidism. You know, slow pulse for hypo, and a rapid pulse for hyper. A feeling very cold all the time, and feeling very hot for hyper. Having dry, brittle hair, having a flushed face, and so on. So for hypothyroidism, it will tend to have rough, dry, scaly skin. But for hyperthyroidism, it will be a warm, uh, almost velvet-like texture to the skin. So these are some very common symptoms between hyper and hypothyroidism. Uh, now we'll move on to the parathyroid glands and a pathology connection here. Uh, the thyroid gland has uh, two small pairs of glands on uh, the posterior side, the parathyroids, and they release a uh, parathyroid hormone, or PTH. These will help to raise blood, le uh, blood levels of calcium. If calcium gets too low, the parathyroids will kick in and release PTH, which will stimulate bone dissolving cells to release more calcium back into the blood. You don't want blood calcium to get too low and you don't want blood calcium to get too high. So parathyroid hormone and calcitonin have opposite effects of one another. Now damage can reduce the production of uh, the PTH which will lead to hypoparathyroidism or an insufficient production of the parathyroid hormone which can lead to a, a drop in calcium levels. So there's no way to get it to increase, so it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Now having too low calcium levels can interfere with nerve functions and can cause tetany, among other uh, other conditions. And the way you treat this would be through calcium and then vitamin D supplements. Right, our next group of major endocrine glands, the adrenals. These are small glands that sit on top of the kidneys, 
looking like a little little hats almost. There are two regions, uh, the cortex and the medulla. The terms cortex and medulla are generic terms in anatomy. They aren't particular just for the adrenals. Cortex is always the outermost layer, and the medulla is more toward the middle. See, the two different regions are made up of two different types of tissue, and they make two different types of hormones. So for the adrenal medulla, it will secrete two different kinds of hormones. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and also norepinephrine, or noradrenaline. Now, norepinephrine is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. So both of these hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, can increase duration of the sympathetic nervous system, and the effects will last longer than the neurotransmitters. So such effects include you know, increased heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, sweaty palms, and so on. So whenever you're in an, an emergency situation, let's say you're almost in a car wreck, for example, even though that situation has passed, you can still feel your heart racing, you can still feel you know, your rapid breathing rate. All those are the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. And the effects are still there, even though the event is over, because these are caused by hormonal effects. The hormone is still racing throughout the bloodstream. It's going to take a while for that to be broken down and to be counteracted by the, the parasympathetic nervous system. The adrenal cortex will make dozens of steroid-related uh, hormones. These are classified as the adrenocorticosteroids, because they come from the adrenal cortex. No, adreno for references the adrenal glands, cortico is a reference to the cortex. Now these are released under the direct stimulation of the anterior pituitary, the hormone ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. This will regulate the control of hormones directly from the cortex of the adrenal. Now many of these hormones are so important that you can die fairly quickly if these are not produced in the levels that they should be. There are two other classes of, of hormones, uh, mineral corticoids, these will help to regulate uh, electrolytes and fluid balances and glucocorticoids will help to regulate blood sugar because glucose is a reference to uh, sugars so aldosterone would be a mineral corticoid uh, cortisol glucocorticoid the other hormones that are responsible for uh, regulation of uh, cell metabolism uh, growth uh, immune system function uh, secondary sex characteristics all these are found within the adrenal cortex also now move on to another uh, pathology connection We'll talk about diabetes mellitus. This is what people think of when they hear the term diabetes, you know, type 1 or type 2. That's diabetes mellitus. So if you have an abnormally high levels of blood sugar as hyperglycemia, this could be caused by a decreased secretion of insulin itself or your body becoming insensitive to insulin uh, being there. Uh, type 1 diabetes or juvenile onset diabetes. This is an immune system uh, condition where you're your immune system will destroy insulin producing cells of the pancreas. So this is an autoimmune condition. The beta cells, the cells that are specifically made for producing insulin are attacked and destroyed. So if insulin can't be made, then blood glucose can't be taken up by body cells because insulin isn't there to help the sugar enter the cells. This is generally diagnosed in people uh, younger than 40. So the result is your body doesn't make enough insulin. So you are you'll be needed to take daily doses of insulin to counteract this. Uh, type 2 or late onset diabetes mellitus this is caused by the insensitivity of the body's tissues to insulin. So ins insulin is being made just fine but your body cells don't perceive it being there, don't react to it well. It's diagnosed in patients that are over 50 especially those who are uh, obese. This can be treated with a controlled diet or a weight loss regimen or anti-diabetic drugs a good way to check for this would be uh, urinalysis or other uh, blood tests. All right, so for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, you'll have an abnormally high blood glucose or hyperglycemia. And it must be resolved. So high glucose levels can cause the kidneys to work much harder than they already do and secrete excess sugar. So when this happens, you have an, an increase in urination and also become uh, more dehydrated. Now, sugar should not be in your urine. When there's an excess sugar found in urine, that means it's not being picked up by your cells, which means there's some issue with the pancreas somewhere. So the stress of trying to get rid of all this excess blood sugar can lead to kidney damage. So if cells don't have glucose, they can't make ATP, which is the energy molecule that all cells need to function. So if a diabetic goes or goes untreated, you can 
lose weight, you become, you get uh, permanent damage to some peripheral nerves, your blood will become increasingly acidic, difficulty with wound healing, and if left untreated can lead to coma and can be fatal. So monitoring and treating your diabetes, whether it be type 1 or type 2, you know, can save your life. So when blue, blood glucose gets too low, or hypoglycemia, this is the primary side effect of taking insulin, because you are taking too much. So insulin is being, or blood sugar is being taken up too quickly, so there's not much left in the blood. So some symptoms of uh, hypoglycemia, uh, hunger, uh, nervousness, uh, dizziness, uh, difficulty speaking, uh, anxiety. These are the early stages. If it continues on, then you'll get mental confusion, you can lead to seizures, uh, coma, and this can become fatal. Uh, having too low uh, blood sugar can lead to uh, fluid balance problems. And cells, in particular cells in the brain, can't get enough glucose that they need to function. Now your body does have a defense against uh, hypoglycemia. When blood sugar gets too low, the pancreas will decrease insulin secretion and will increase glucagon secretion in order to raise levels of blood sugar. And the reason why this is, if your blood sugar is low already, you don't want to make more insulin to make it go even lower. So your pancreas will basically shut down insulin and then crank up glucagon to get more blood sugar into the blood. The adrenal medulla will secrete epinephrine. Uh, the hypothalamus will, will sense the decrease in the blood sugar and will trigger actions of the adrenal gland via the uh, sympathetic nervous system control, which will cause feelings of hunger. So patients will eat food, and therefore you'll get another source of glucose through the food that you are uh, food that you're eating. The reason why epinephrine will be secreted here, epinephrine is used under high stress or emergency situations. When your body is in that condition, it will tap all sources it can to get blood glucose, whether it be uh, turning fat cells back into glucose, turning glycogen into glucose, turning non-carbohydrate sources into glucose. But the overall effects of all this is to raise blood sugar levels. So for a diabetic, a hypoglycemic can become a recurrent problem because this can lead to damage of the autonomic nervous system. So this will decrease the, ability, the body's ability uh, to defend against hypoglycemia. If you are a diabetic and you take insulin, it's very important that you are taking the proper amount. You know, taking too much can be can lead to serious problems. Taking too little can lead to serious problems. See the treatment for hypoglycemia, of course, getting sugar quickly into the bloodstream. So drinking soft drinks, uh, orange juice, hard candies, all that will ingest a high amount of sugar relatively quickly. And if you have a, a severe case of hypoglycemia, you will need medical attention immediately. I hear some common effects of diabetes mellitus. It can cause damage to the eyes, no, diabetic uh, retinopathy. It can cause damage to the kidneys. It can lead to heart disease and heart attack. Uh, it can lead to strokes. It can lead to uh, damage to the aorta and its uh, various branches off the aorta. So being diabetic or even pre-diabetic is not something to take lightly. Right, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now they're similar in how they are different. Of course, type 1, juvenile onset. This is an autoimmune condition. The way you treat it is daily injections of insulin. Now, your body can't make enough insulin because your body's immune system is destroying the cells that make it. And some common symptoms, usually sudden and severe excess urination, uh, extreme thirst, and also weight loss. So even though you may be drinking loads and loads of water, you are still constantly thirsty. and You're still constantly urinating. Now, for type 2, this is insulin resistance. So the insulin levels are fine that are made by the pancreas, but your cells can't take them up. The way you control this, especially in the early, early stages, you know, through diet, through weight loss, exercise, and the symptoms tend to be more subtle uh, than type 1, you know, excessive urination, uh, thirst. But both of these can be managed, you know, assuming it is uh, diagnosed early enough. All right, now we'll move on to another pathology connection with uh, steroid-related conditions. The first one we'll talk about is Addison's. Now, Addison's is caused by an insufficient production of the adrenocorticosteroids. Now, there are two of those, uh, cortisol and aldosterone. Uh, cortisol is also classified as a glucocorticoid because it involves different levels of glucose in the blood. And aldosterone is a mineral corticoid because it deals with maintaining uh, fluid balance and electrolytes and blood pressure. Some symptoms of Addison's. Uh, weight loss, uh, muscle weakness, fatigue, uh, low blood pressure, irritability, uh, excessive skin pigmentation, uh, depression. Some possible causes of Addison's. 
It could be due to cancers or an infection or an autoimmune uh, process or with abnormalities of the hypothalamus and pituitary. Addison's is diagnosed with uh, blood tests and also imaging, such as MRI and CAT scan. And treatment will consist of hormone replacement. Our Cushing syndrome. This is caused by an over-secretion of cortisol. The common symptoms of Cushing's upper body obesity, a moon face or a round face, uh, easy bruising, osteoporosis, uh, fatigue, depression, uh, hypertension, and hyperglycemia. As may be a side effect due to uh, steroids or due to pituitary tumors, uh, tumors on the adrenals, or even some combinations of genetic disorders. The diagnosis is complicated. Uh, the treatment will depend on the underlying cause of the disorder. The classic Cushing's uh, syndrome is due to a pituitary tumor that leads to too much production of ACTH. Therapeutic steroids, prescription steroids like prednisone, is used commonly for treatments of uh, inflammation, organ transplant rejection, uh, immune disorders, but can also have dangerous side effects. These can include bone density loss, uh, weight gain, fat deposits, and also uh, slowing how quickly wounds can heal. Now one of the key things about these kinds of therapeutic steroids, you can't just stop them suddenly. When a patient takes a steroid medication, the adrenal gland will decrease steroid production in response to that. So you can't just stop this cold turkey. There are some uh, biochemical changes that occur here. These are changes in the adrenal gland itself and changes to the immune system caused by the steroid use. All right, now I'll talk about uh, steroid abuses, such as anabolic steroids. Of course, the primary effect is on uh, the body, such as uh, a much larger muscle mass. This is used primarily to uh, enhance performance or enhance muscle size. All right, those are the, the primary effects on the body, but there are some uh, side effects also. For men, uh, the shrinking of testicles and decreased sperm production is common. Uh, also, the development of breasts in women, uh, the deepening of a voice, uh, a decreased breast size, and also excessive body hair growth. are some side effects that you'll find in both uh, males and females. Uh, an increased cholesterol level, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, suppressed immune function, uh, possible exposure to hepatitis B or HIV if you are injecting with uh, shared needles, and also aggressive behavior, the roid rage that people commonly, commonly associate with anabolic steroids. And all major and all amateur athletic organizations ban the use of steroids. All right, now talk about uh, cortisol and the stress response. Uh, cortisol is all, also known as the, uh, the stress hormone. Now your body has a, a set response to any kind of stressor, whether it be psychological or physiological. Uh, some examples of physical stresses, uh, hypothermia, uh, decreased blood volume, uh, hyperglycemia, uh, some examples of uh, psychological stresses, when you're almost in a car accident or getting ready for a big exam or making a public speech or so on. Now, during a stress response, the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal cortex are activated. So you have an increased production and release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. These will cause blood pressure to go up, heart rate to increase, respiration to increase, and levels of blood glucose to go up. Because your body is preparing for an emergency situation. So you'll need large amounts of energy right away. So you need blood to be pumped throughout the body faster. That's why your heart rate goes up. That's why the breathing rate goes up. Now the adrenal cortex will also will release cortisol, causing another increase in blood glucose, but this also changes the immune response. Now in short spurts, this initial stress response is necessary and incredibly helpful. But if this were to continue, if you're under a continued amount of stress for a long period of time, well your body will react the same way. So you don't want to be exposed to epinephrine all the time. You don't want to be exposed to cortisol all the time over a prolonged amount of time. And the saying that stress kills is literally true. Too much cortisol for too long a time can tear apart blood vessels. It can lower your immune response. It is not healthy to have a prolonged exposure to stress over and over and over again. So if your stress is chronic, the secretion of cortisol and epinephrine becomes pathological. It can cause disease. It can make you sick and it can become fatal and your body's response to these chronic stresses is mediated by other factors. Now factors associated with lower cholesterol levels, increased optimism, a greater social support mechanism, and lower perceived stress. So if you're under a high amount of cortisol, all these would be the opposite. If you have a higher, higher cortisol levels, you frequently will deal with depression and anxiety because you are so stressed, which leads to more stress, which makes you 
more anxious and more depressed. So this is a, a vicious cycle that keeps going around and around and around. Now I'll move on to uh, some other uh, major endocrine glands. I'll talk about the uh, gonads. And the term gonad is a general term that refers to the primary sex organ. So for males, the gonads are the testes, and for females, the gonads are the ovaries. Of course, their chief function is to produce and store gametes, which are the sex cells. For males, that'd be the sperm, and for females, those would be the eggs. These also will produce a number of sex hormones which control reproduction, such as testosterone in males and estrogen and progesterone in females. You also have uh, prostaglandins. These are molecules that act like hormones. Many different body tissues will produce a form of prostaglandins. There's a large variety of functions depending on where they're produced, but the effects are going to be powerful even though they are short-term on local tissues. Right, now move on to common diseases of the endocrine system. The first one, diabetes insipidus. Uh, etiology is a deficiency in antidiuretic hormone. Uh, some common signs, very large amounts of urine, large amounts of uh, very dilute urine. Some diagnostic tests, you want to rule out diabetes mellitus. You also will like to monitor the ADH levels. Uh, if caused by medication, obviously the way to treat it is to eliminate that medication. Low ADH, you'll be given a synthetic form of vasopressin. And vasopressin is another name for ADH. Syndrome of in inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH. Uh, etiology, uh, an excess ADH production, which is caused by a pulmonary disease, or cancer, or medications, or central nervous system disorders that lead to very very low levels of sodium in the blood. Some signs and symptoms, uh, confusion, uh, fatigue, nausea, altered consciousness, muscle cramps, loss of appetite. All right, some common diagnostic tests for SIADH. You need to rule out traumatic brain injury, or TBI, and also evaluate the volume status. Treatments, uh, restrict water, and then the infusion of hypertonic saline. All right, next one, Cushing's disease. Uh, etiology, excess cortisol, due to a benign uh, pituitary tumor. Common signs and symptoms, abdominal obesity, easy bruising, uh, hypertension, uh, hyperglycemia, uh, depression. Some diagnostic tests for Cushing's. Uh, imaging, uh, blood cortisol levels, urine cholesterol levels, uh, CTH levels, uh, pituitary biopsy, dexamethasone uh, suppression tests. Treatments, uh, removal of the tumor, followed by uh, hormonal replacement. Uh, if it's caused by an overdose or overuse of steroids, uh, decreasing of steroids or eliminating them altogether. Uh, here's a picture of an infant with uh, congenital hypothyroidism. Here's a picture of a patient with uh, Cushing's syndrome. A patient with gigantism. And gigantism is also uh, associated with acromegaly. Etiology is where you have excess growth hormone from the hyperfunction or uh, usually due to a tumor on the pituitary gland. Uh, in children, uh, the overgrowth of the long bones will result in rapid growth in height to uh, excess compared to normal heights for someone their age. And in adults, the excess growth and deformity of body tissues. So not only will the adult grow taller, but the bones will become much thicker, which will alter the shape of the skull and the face, the tongue. Uh, it will impact the overall deepness of the voice, overall heart rate and breathing rate, uh, muscle weakness. Some diagnostic tests. Uh, imaging, check for tumors uh, on the pituitary, uh, and of course blood tests for hormone levels. Uh, for treatments, removal of the pituitary tumor, and then followed up by hormone replacements. See the opposite of that, dwarfism. The etiology, the growth hormone deficiency of the pituitary in childhood. Uh, some signs and symptoms uh, in children. A failure to attain a normal height for a child of that age. And abnormally slow growth. Some diagnostic tests, blood tests, you know, they rule out other forms of dwarfism. There are multiple forms of dwarfism. Uh, treatments, early diagnosis, and injections of growth hormone. Uh, Graves' disease, uh, etiology, is hyperthyroidism due to an autoimmune attack on the thyroid. Uh, some signs and symptoms, uh, tremors, uh, sweating, uh, weakness, uh, tachycardia, arrhythmias, uh, irritability. Uh, some diagnostic tests, blood tests, you can check for low TSH levels but high T4 levels, and also using uh, radioactive uh, iodine uptake as some treatments, uh, removal or destruction of the thyroid or antithyroid medication, and then followed by daily thyroid hormone. Hashimoto's disease, uh, etiology, as a hypothyroidism due to an autoimmune attack on the thyroid. Uh, some signs and symptoms, 
uh, fatigue, thinning, uh, brittle hair, uh, bradycardia, uh, depression. It's a diagnostic test. Uh, you have a high T TSH level, but low T4. And for treatments, uh, the daily thyroid hormone. Uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, etiology, uh, insulin deficiency caused by either an autoimmune attack on the, the pancreas or by insulin resistance, depending on it, whether or not you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Some signs and symptoms, uh, excess urination and an increased thirst due to a high blood glucose. Uh, some diagnostic testing, uh, checking the levels of glucose within the urine, checking levels of glucose within the blood, and also glucose tolerance testing. Uh, some common treatments, diet, exercise, uh, anti-diabetic medications for type 2 and for type 1, insulin injections. Addison's disease, uh, etiology for here, uh, deficiency of the adrenal corticosteroids due to an autoimmune attack on the adrenal cortex. Uh, some signs and symptoms, uh, weakness, hypotension, hypoglycemia, depression, fatigue, some diagnostic tests for Addison's, uh, imaging, and then blood tests for uh, corticosteroids, and the most common treatment is uh, hormone replacement. See, chronic stress, uh, etiology, and excess cortisol in response to stressors. Remember, some cortisol for a short amount of time is fine, and actually is, is necessary, but you don't want it to be for too long a time. Uh, some signs and symptoms, depression, uh, anxiety, uh, obesity, hypertension, the increased uh, susceptibility to infections, hypercholesterolemia. Some diagnostic tests, there's no good one test for this kind of condition because uh, the effects of the stress may vary widely among individuals. You know, some people just respond differently to stress than others. Uh, treatments, of course, to uh, decrease the amount of stress. The treatment of the symptoms, which will just vary by individual. All right, now move on to our pharmacology corner. Uh, some hormone replacements and some analogs. Uh, Synthroid, this is a synthetic hormone that's used to treat hypothyroidism. Hydrocortisone, this is a steroid that's used to replace uh, cortisol in the treatment uh, for Addison's disease. Prednisone, this uh, acts like a corticosteroid. Its overall effect is to replace corticosteroids as an anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, growth hormone, uh, injection in uh, children with growth hormone deficiencies to help them uh, speed up their their growing process. Uh, some common medications, uh, insulin, of course administered by injections or by inhaled aerosols. Glucophage, this will help to make uh, the effects of insulin stronger so it can function more effectively. Minutane, this is a cortisol inhibitor. This is used to treat some forms of Cushing's syndrome. Uh, somatostatin uh, analogs, now, somatostatin is a normal hormone produced by the delta cells of the pancreas. Uh, these analogs will decrease growth hormone production and will be a treatment for acromegaly. Okay, this brings us to the end of chapter number 10. Uh, we will continue our anatomy series with chapter number 11.